Hello, everyone. We're glad to have you with us in this midweek study. I was trying to think of what we might study in view of the fact we just finished the study of history between the Testaments. And I thought before we go into any other book of the Bible, we would sort of continue on the line of uh, some history matters and just simply take a look at the background of the Roman Empire at the time of the, well, the area or the time period that we run across, John the Baptist, Jesus, and so on. It's important to understand that God revealed his scheme of redemption, how he would save man from sin, in time and space, which is another definition of history. So it can be verified like you could anything else as far as history is concerned. So the historical events that are recorded in the New Testament took place in the real world of the Roman Empire of the first century. And we need to recognize that fact. Uh, just as the events of any given day of your life or my life have meaning in relation to certain cities, political institutions, certain people, or events such as we're undergoing now, then the same was true when it came to the people of the first century in the Roman Empire, and especially Jesus, the apostles, and the first century church. It really is a mistake to try to understand any document, any document as it's meant to be understood, apart from an awareness of its original setting. Now, let me see if I can illustrate that. Imagine reading a diary page of someone at Pearl Harbor on December the 7th, 1941, without knowing a thing about what happened on that day as far as world history is concerned. You would understand some things, but to have a full understanding of what all was involved, you would not have. One is no more successful then in reading, if you would like to call it this, Physician Luke's diary pages of Paul's preaching tours, apart from an awareness of their world situation. Now, then you may say, well, are you saying we can't learn how to be saved and live a faithful Christian life unless we know these things? No, what I'm saying is you can't have the appreciation that you ought to have, that it's uh, important to have, so that you can decipher and understand certain things if you don't have that awareness. The other thing may be even more important when you try to meet the challenges of people that don't want to believe the Bible is the inspired word of God and thus try to discredit it by showing it's wrong historically, then it helps to be able to know these things. And the greater the secular world is and the more influential that it is, then the need to know certain of these matters. Of course, what we're going to do here for I'm not sure quite how many nights, is not be able to give you an item by item study that could take years, but to give you a brief survey of what was going on in that world. So we want to attempt to get a picture of the general situation of the Roman world in the first century. So let's begin by examining the larger Roman world and then move from there. We'll focus particular attention on the situation in Palestine. Now, the remainder of our studies, however long you study the New Testament text, which should be as long as you possess your faculties the rest of your life, will presuppose an awareness of the situation in the Roman world, since not only did Jesus and the apostles and the early Christians live then, but the whole New Testament was written during that first century of the first millennium. The final section of the study that we'll look at 
will give a brief overview of the New Testament literature itself. Now, with that, those introductory remarks, let's look to the larger Roman world of the first century in the last millennium. You recognize during the entire period covered by the writings of the New Testament, and for that matter, several generations following the production of what we have as the New Testament, Rome more than dominated the world. First of all, let's look at the political structure of the empire. During the time that the New Testament was written, Rome was no longer a republic, but for all practical purposes, it was a monarchy. Now, the Romans would not call it a monarchy, but it basically had one man rule, though they had a Senate that still continued from the days of it being a republic. But pretty much Julius Caesar put an end to the republic, and you might say that Augustus, uh, his nephew by the name of Octavian, was the one that drove the nails in the coffin of the Republic. The following we'll look at for a moment, simply not expecting you to uh, remember them, but to just hear the names of the emperors of the first century and look at some events of their reign because they are significant to the New Testament student. We'll begin with Augustus, Octavius Caesar, who was an actual nephew of Julius, but Julius adopted him as son. So when Julius was assassinated, he received everything that Julius had, and that meant he would be, as we would consider today, um, a billionaire. Augustus was running things in Rome and the empire from 30 BC to AD 14. Then at his death, and we'll not go into all the relations, but Tiberius began to rule and he ruled from AD 14 to 37. He is the Caesar who was um, during the days of the ministry and death of Christ. Of course, you recognize Augustus as being the Caesar when Christ was born. And uh, I'll mention Luke 2 and 1 concerning Augustus and Luke chapter 3, verse 1 concerning Tiberius. And we'll use his common name, though he wouldn't have liked it. The next one from AD 37 to 41 was Caligula. That comes from the Latin term meaning little boot because his father Germanicus uh, was a Roman general, if you would call him that, a part of the royal family. And uh, they would dress him up in a uh, soldier's uniform when he was little, and he'd run around the camp. So the soldiers started calling him Caligula, which meant little boot. Um, there's really nothing said about him in the New Testament, so we won't be mentioning events as it pertained to him. But he was such a lunatic that the Praetorian Guard assassinated him, and they placed Claudius Caesar in his place uh, from 41 to 54 AD. And you'll remember in relationship to Luke's record of the great famine that he's mentioned in Acts chapter 11, verse 28. Also, he's mentioned in connection with the expulsion of the Jews from Rome in Acts chapter 18, verse 2. Then, uh, following his death, Nero came to the throne, and he stayed on it from A.D. 54 to A.D. 68. And uh, he would be the one whom Paul appeared before, having earlier appealed to Caesar to get out of the hands of the Jews. As a Roman citizen, every Roman citizen, in fact, had the right to appeal to Caesar to make their case be known. Acts 25, verse 10, and chapter 28, verse 19. Then there was a great upheaval because from then on, really, the Praetorian Guard 
and the legions of Rome played a great important part in who was Caesar. You had what's called the year of the three Caesars. Once Nero uh, committed suicide, basically, uh, in AD 68, a fellow by the name of Galba, and then in 69, Otho, and then again in 69, Vitellius, all were Caesars who went up and went down because they were assassinated. Well, when Vitellius went down, the wars of the Jews was on, the details of which you can read about in Josephus. And the legions voted for Vespasian, who was leading the put down of the rebellion to come back to Rome, and he ruled from 69 to 79, and that's the reason his son Titus was there when Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed. Following Vespasian, Titus came to the throne from 79 to 81, and um, Domitian followed from 81 to 96. Then there was Nerva, 96 to 98, and the last one we'll mention is Trajan, 98 to 117 in the second century. Domitian uh, is the one who pretty much led the national or empire-wide revolt. I shouldn't say revolt. I should say persecution. And sometime in the time of Nerva or Trajan, then it's thought by many that the book of Revelation was written. Now, that'll give you an idea of the Caesars who were over things during the biblical portion and covered all the time and then some that the New Testament was being written and the gospel being spread. It didn't, that is the church, didn't get empire-wide attention until after the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple because it became apparent then that the church was not just an offshoot of the Jews. It's obvious to the Romans that it was something that stood on its own. And thus, following AD 70, it began to make great leaps and bounds based upon the work of Paul and his three preaching tours to spread throughout the empire. And it ceased being so much involved, as you read in the book of Acts, uh, among the Jews. The various provinces of the Roman Empire were allowed somewhat, and we noted this last week when we mentioned Rome at the end of the matters of the silent 400 years, that they were allowed some self-rule, a measure of self-rule, but always closely supervised by the Romans. And the key to that, as I said last time together, was they had to remain loyal to the Roman Empire, to the Roman government. Proconsuls ruled the safer provinces by an annual appointment from the Senate of Rome. Procurators governed the less secure areas by direct authority from the emperor. Now, before I go any further, I want to mention for those of you um, that are interested at some studies, get a more detail, a couple of books that you might find interesting. The book by Michael Grant, now deceased on the 12 Caesars, covers those from Augustus. I think it goes all the way up through um, that's patient. I'm not sure, but I believe that's right. Uh, the reason I recommend it for those who think history is totally dry and a bore is because Michael Grant is much of a scholar as anybody else in this field. He's been dead now many years, but uh, he wrote in a way that you might find the novelist writing. So it's very interesting to read, and that'll help you get a better idea of the Roman Empire. The other book, also written by the late Michael Grant, is one that'll help you see how the empire looked at the Jews and how the Jews lived under the empire. 
and um, it doesn't have a dust jacket on it, but it's called the Jews of the Roman world. So both of those, in fact, any of the books Michael Grant wrote would be interesting when it relates to Roman history. So I thought I'd mention those for anybody that might like to have some good detailed history written very well by a great writer as well as a scholar. Roman law was a significant contribution to the progress of civilization, especially after all of the empires that went before. Also, I might mention that really English common law, which our laws are based, are derived to a great extent from Roman law, or at least have their foundation in it. Rights and duties were clearly defined in explicit and well-organized collection of law. And the enforcement of Roman law was generally quite fair and direct. When you let simply the way the Caesars lived and what you read about the persecution and the immoral, amoral society that they had, you might say, well, there wouldn't be much at all in the way of any kind of uh, fairness in them. But there was. Uh, when it came down to the ordinary operations, day-to-day -day matters, then they would be pretty fair when it came to determining who was guilty and who was not and how to settle problems. It's very interesting to read about how it all worked. And uh, you might remember the name Cicero, but he was one who lived up till the time and just after Julius Caesar was assassinated, and he was known even, and is known today even for his great oratory, but just to read about how they pled their cases before the Roman court. Citizenship in Rome was a special rank reserved for a fortunate few. Now, you know how that impacts us then in seeing the providential care of God and having somebody like the Paul as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Um, birth, imperial grant, or by purchase would secure citizenship in the early days of the empire. And in one way or the other, that's how some of Paul's ancestors received their citizenship because Paul made it clear in uncertain terms that he was born free. So somebody in his family had it before him. Now, it may have been his father, but it may have been his grandfather, but somewhere or the other, some of his ancestors received it, and he was freeborn. In the second and third centuries, the base of citizenship was broadened until all non-slaves of the empire were granted it. But it wasn't so in the first century uh, when Paul uh, got his citizenship by being freeborn. The special rights of citizens then figure into the New Testament account of Paul's life, Acts chapter 22, verses 25 through 29. Uh, let me say again, and for those that heard my sermon on Esther at spring this past Sunday, you can see how God is not limited, but he can take anything there is for good or bad and work it for the good of his people and for the purpose he intended. Now, under the empire, travel and communication were possible in the world on an unprecedented scale. Roman roads connected the great population center. There's still some of those roads today that you can travel on. They knew how to build a road that would remain, and some you can ride on over there today, are now over 2,000 years old. They did that because, as the old saying goes, and it's still heard sometime, all roads lead to Rome. There could always be messages from those far-flung parts of the empire gotten back to the emperor pretty quickly in view of the way that they had to travel, which was walking or in some sort of a conveyance drawn by a beast of some kind or else going by ship. But the big thing was they could move their armies very quickly down these roads 
to get them to any hot spot where they needed to be rather rapidly. The sea had been cleared of pirates and made safe for travel. If you study Roman history, then there's a, a quite a bit of time spent on the seas being cleared of pirates at one certain point. We don't think of that much today, but there was a time when pirates uh, bothered everything. And for many hundreds of years, uh, any of the ships that travel, there were pirates there to take them over. We've already emphasized the common tongue that came because of Alexander the Great's work, the Koine or Common Greek, and it was spoken throughout what was called the civilized world, the Roman world. The economic situation of the Roman world is worth looking at. The entire Roman world, the whole empire, was dominated by farming or agrarian considerations. We don't tend to think that way today because there's so many manufacturing to-dos in our country and the world, but it was primarily agrarian in their day and time. There were small shops such as uh, bakeries and carpenter shops. Remember, Jesus was raised a carpenter. And that kind of what we would call uh, home-type businesses and they produced people for the goods in their areas. There was a great amount of shipping that was done, but it was bringing in things like foodstuffs and clothing and all kinds of things of that nature. Um, they had ships that were routinely by the hundreds traveling throughout the Mediterranean and on much further than that, bringing back things from various places that you couldn't get in the Roman a world around the Mediterranean. Those without land and those without special skills are either poorly paid laborers or simply forced into slavery. This was a time when people that couldn't pay their bills would be sold into slavery. Slaves dominated the empire and there were more slaves in the first century than there were free people. The value of Roman money was uh, remarkably stable in the first century. The denarius was the most common coin of the day. And one denarius was the standard day's wage for the unskilled laborer who was a free man. You might jot down Matthew chapter 20 and verse 2 just to see how that's used. In the Roman conquest is where the empire got most of the people who were uh, in slavery. There were more slaves, as I said, and I say it again for emphasis, than free people in the first century world. Most of them worked uh, the large or huge land holdings of the wealthy aristocracy. Slaves were considered property and afforded no real rights as human beings. I might mention, though, that many of those slaves were quite talented, highly educated, many of the Greeks were, and they could be given their freedom. And oftentimes they were. They were even allowed to make money for themselves, save up money, and uh, pay their owner to become free. And because many of them were so loyal and uh, they were so well educated and trained and whatever they did, then they would receive their, their freedom. Um, the slaves though, and the free poor people lived rather frugal lives. We turn now to the religion and the morality of the Romans. And that covered astrology of every kind and magic of every stripe and all kinds of superstitions flourished. Look at Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 24, and you'll get a little bit of taste of that with Philip, and what he ran into when he went down to Samaria to preach, Acts 8, 9 through 24. Now, the traditional gods of the Greco-Roman heritage were 
still worshipped in the first century. I must say here, though, that a great many of the higher-ups in government and so forth really didn't believe much. But it's not like saying today that a person who has had a background in Christianity of some sort doesn't uh, believe in God. They didn't know the God of the Bible to not believe in. They didn't know about Jesus Christ. They certainly knew nothing about Christianity. Uh, so they didn't have anything else to turn to. Besides that, their concept of God was like the superheroes. And uh, they operated about the same way, too. The various kinds of cults existed, existed in different locations. You might take a note of Acts chapter 19 and verse 27 and verses 34 and 35. Acts 19, 27, verses 34 and 35. In general, however, traditional religion was in the process of losing its grip on the people and was in decline. In fact, if you'll remember, we talked about Rome during that 400 silent years, finally getting over into Egypt and Palestine. And when they got over in that part of the country during the days of the Republic, the Romans ran across all of these Eastern gods and all these gods of Egypt. Well, that began to change things because they embraced those things and brought them back with them. So things were in turmoil as far as that's concerned. You had the mystery religions from the East. They had become quite popular. So Roastrianism, Mithraism, from down in Egypt, Isis, and then there was Serapis, and on and on. If you go study all that, you can get into a whole lot of it. But these entered in in the place of Zeus and Apollos and all of those. They were all there together. It was just a hodgepodge. And on top of that, everybody was as superstitious as they could be. Any kind of thing that went bump in the night and was considered to be good luck or bad luck impacted the Roman mind. There were more personal than the traditional religions, and they offered salvation through all kinds of secret rites and ceremonies. Thus, they offered an outlet for emotion, and they gave some sort of social equality among those that were initiated into those particular mystery religions. Emperor worship became increasingly important toward the end of the first century. Now, for some time, when an emperor like Augustus died, then they would elevate him to deity. But then it began to be while they were still alive. The Senate was the body that deified the emperors. But as I say, that was early on, under or after the deaths of the emperors. Finally, toward the end, and I mentioned him earlier, of the first century, Domitian actually proclaimed himself Dominus et Deus, which is Lord and God, and he compelled his subjects to worship him. Um, a certain value of Rome came of uh, unifying patriotism and religion. The emperors and those in control were paranoid to the nth degree. And as I said earlier, they allowed for a lot of liberty and religion and local government, but they were all afraid somebody would rise up and kill them and take over or do away with the Roman Empire. Now, when all of this is going on, you have to realize this is impacting the ordinary man in the Roman Empire who doesn't have a connection with the Jews of the Old Testament. And in effect, what has happened is that the stage was set for the conflict with Christians. There were several philosophies that had been around for a long time. Platonism, Gnosticism, Stoicism, and so on. These uh, served as a religion of just small groups of Romans. 
but they served as a system that would help them in keeping control or holding an affinity with the common people. Now, all of these different ones I mentioned and more that I didn't mention did not do a thing for helping people live on a high plane of morality. The only ones doing that were those that were faithful to the Old Testament and they were Jews or else proselytes. Se several of these religions actually promoted all kinds of vice and immorality. And again, I'll simply cite you to Romans chapter 1 and the general state of affairs among the Gentiles when it came to morality to see what it was like throughout the Roman Empire. I like to say sometimes that if you can vision in your mind, if you can vision all of these denominational church buildings all around us, and then in your mind go to the Roman Empire and imagine them as all sorts of pagan temples, and all kinds of things going on in them, and all of it fully acceptable, and nobody thought anything about it. It was just business as usual, and it had been going on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. The Roman Empire had so many bad features. Uh, we've mentioned slavery. It had oppressive taxation. It had very low morality, and you could name some other things along that too. Uh, they didn't mind stealing when they could steal and not get caught, and all that kind of thing went on. But Rome's rule of the world did create a situation in which the gospel of Jesus Christ could spread rapidly. That's why you have a general statement that's so important that Paul made to the Galatian churches in Galatians 4 and verse 4 in the fullness of time. That was the Roman Empire. God sent forth his son. Thus, Daniel predicted in Daniel 2 and uh, verse 44 that at that time there would be a kingdom that would be established and it would reign and go on forever. Now let's turn more particularly to Palestine during this time period. The situation in Palestine under Roman rule was a rather unique one. And this causes us to look and focus in on the political situation there. I mentioned last week that Pompey the Great was the one that actually conquered this region back in uh, 63 BC. I mentioned then too that he put Antipater in charge of the Jews' homeland, and he was rewarded by being made procurator in 55 BC. Upon his death by assassination in 43 BC, Palestine was thrown into turmoil. The Jews hoped to rid themselves, and we studied about this last week, of the Edomians, for they were the ones that Antipater came from. But Rome secured the position of Herod, Antipater's son, who began to rule as king of the Jews in 37 B.C. Now the Herodians, or the members of the Herodian dynasty, are contacted rather frequently when you're reading the New Testament. And let me mention just real quickly, and you'll just probably need to go to a study Bible you may have or whatever you have that gives these things, and look at the Herodian dynasty. There was Antipater, as I said, then his son Herod the Great, and that's the one we come across, Matthew 2 and verse 1. Herod the Great ruled from 37 to 4 B.C. Now, Herod had uh, Philip, Antipas, Aristobulus, Archelaus, and Herod Philip. Now, each one of these and his relationship to Herod would be interested to study. Herod Philip is mentioned in Mark 6, 17, 
Herod Antipas, 4 B.C. to A.D. 39, is mentioned in Luke 3 and verse 1. We don't have any mention in the Bible of Aristobulus. You do have uh, of Archelaus, 4 B.C. to A.D. 6, in Matthew chapter 2, verse 22. And then there was Herod Philip, 4 B.C. to A.D. 34, Luke chapter 3 and verse 1. Now, And you'll remember Herodias in Mark 6, 17. And uh, then coming down from Herod Agrippa the first, we come across Bernice, who's mentioned in Acts 25, 13. Herod Agrippa the second, AD 48 to 70, Acts chapter 25, verse 13. And Drusilla, who's mentioned in Acts 24, 24. We just mentioned in this list those people who have some connection as far as the Bible is concerned. I know you're not going to remember all of those, but this may help you to know what Herod is being talked about when it just refers to them as Herod, because it's not always Herod the Great. The rule of Judea and Samaria was actually, and finally, in the hands of Roman procurators for most of the first century. Upon the death of Herod the Great in 4 BC, now we come to what I said about these divisions. Palestine was divided among three of Herod's sons. Archelaus was made ethnarch of Judea. That included Samaria and Idumea. Uh, Antipas was made tetrarch of Galilee and Perea. And Philip became tetrarch some northern parts of what we simply call Transjordan. Now, Archelaus was so cruel, and he was also inept, that Rome removed and banished him in A.D. 6. Now, you can go through a host of procurators. You can look them up if you want to. You can do it on Google, some other place that were involved in uh, Judea in the first century. And there's quite a number of them. We won't go through them here. But for a moment in the time remaining, let's look at uh, economic and social conditions of Palestine. There was a wealthy and powerful aristocracy, and it consisted of just a few families a priest. They controlled all the business done in the temple. Revenue was generated from the sale of animals, exchange of money, but you had to use the temple coin when you were there in the temple to worship. So you had to exchange whatever you had to the money of the temple and so on. Now, you know, Jesus cleansed the temple twice and both times he ran the animals out. He had a little scourge, and he turned over the money changers' tables and declared plainly, my house shall be called a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. That ought to tell us something about that. So when he did that, that would be quite a, uh, a to-do among all the hierarchy. The majority of the Jews were really very poor. They were fishermen. They were craftsmen. They were farmers, and they made just a get by living. There was very little slavery among the Jews. And if you notice in reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you don't run across that. Social divisions among the people were not so pronounced as in the Roman society in general. Basically, the distinctions existed in the difference in the rich and the poor and the educated, formerly so, and the illiterate. Remember what was said when the apostles stood up to preach by the power of the Holy Spirit in all these different languages, that they noted that they were from Galilee, and that was a poor part of the country, and how could they know all these languages? So 
they were basically divided on the basis of their economic condition. When it comes to religion and morality among the Jews, they, out of all of the whole Roman Empire, and that's a, a great area, are quite different in so many respects. And yet they were quite different from pure Judaism under the law of Moses. The Jewish ritual of sacrifice centered the nation's attention strictly on the temple in Jerusalem. The priesthood was dominated by Jewish liberals, the Sadducees, and they manipulated the Roman procurators. The Castle Antonio was to the north of the temple and connected virtually to it so the Roman procurator could be directly connected with the chief priest and so on. Annas and Caiaphas are the two high priests who come to our attention in the life of Christ. The former was high priest from AD 6 um, to 7 and then in 15. The latter, Annas, who is his son-in-law, held the post, I believe it was from 18 to 36. We mentioned the synagogue and how it came into existence during the Babylonian captivity. And it actually became more important than the temple in the everyday lives of the Jews because there could be synagogues, all sorts of places where the Jews uh, socialized and did their worship day by day, their teaching, and so on. And each Jewish community had a synagogue. The law and the traditions dominated the Jewish life. Of course, the law of Moses has always been precious to them, but it had even become more so during the time of the exile in Babylon. The scribes, as I mentioned last week, had become the official students and teachers of the law of Moses. They built up a great body of traditions around the law, and they came to exalt those traditions even above law of Moses to the point of setting aside just what the law of Moses said. You see Jesus rebuking them strongly for that in Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. Several parties within Judaism are important to us as we study the scriptures. You know about several of these. The Pharisees were a small but exceedingly strict and highly respected group. Their practice of separatism offered fostered hypocrisy, which the Lord dealt with regularly. The Sadducees drew from the wealthy landowning class, and they dominated the priesthood. Um, and their willingness to collaborate with Rome made them exceedingly unpopular with the people of Palestine. Then there was the sect that we don't read of in the New Testament known as the Essenes, and they were a monastic group. We know of them mainly because of the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in one of their communities on the Dead Sea called Qumran. And other than that, they didn't last long because they didn't believe in marriage. The Jewish Sanhedrin, or known also as a council, was a supreme court of Judaism. It heard all major disputes over religious and social issues that could not be settled in the lower courts of the elders. An appreciation of the Jewish situation is important to the study of the New Testament. It's, it's very social background. And as Christianity started among the Jews, how it was involved with all of those things. Well, I'm going to end here, and we'll look a little more along this line uh, next week, but I hope that you'll see fit to look even a little more detail at these things to get a better understanding of the background, the society, and the culture into which God placed his son and was the right time for the church to be established and the gospel to be preached. You know, we're in this COVID-19 virus. It'd be ridiculous to 
try to study what's going on in our culture and society right now and not have an understanding of what caused everybody to be doing what they're doing and how it's affecting the government and the schools and all the cities. So you have to realize there were all those kind of things that went on and have always gone in the wor- on in the world and its societies. And the Lord saw fit to set forth the way of salvation and bring it into existence during this time in the Roman Empire. So we thank you for being with us. We hope you have a good night. And we hope you keep praying this COVID virus thing will disappear some way or the other in God's good providence. So thank you, and we bid you a good evening.